Hello everybody, this is chapter 10, the Jacksonian era. This is a very important chapter, there's a lot to cover, so let's get started. So the rise of mass politics, why is it called the age of Jackson? Um, during this time, more Americans participated in politics, and what I mean Americans is white males. Um, property requirements and taxpayer requirements disappeared, which is that they were no longer a factor to vote. You no longer need to be a property owner to vote in America. Um, however, voting did not extend to women and African Americans, just to poor white males. So more Americans were getting involved if you were white males. We have the Door Rebellion, where we forced con um, conservatives in Rhode Island to adopt a new constitution, allowing middle class white men to vote. So this helped with middle class white uh, men to vote in Rhode Island and extended suffrage to them, to white males. Um, it benefited, of course, the middle class and white males. Remember, women and African Americans could still not vote. We have the presidential electors. In the past, the old way of doing things is we chose by state legislature, where the state would choose a representative and then they would choose the president eventually. So it was a very small elite process. The new way of doing this um, in 1828 all um, but the Supreme Court allowed popular vote for of electors. So that means that if you got the popular vote, you would be allowed to be president, which is what happened to Andrew Jackson in the first the first time he ran for president. But it was because of the state elector that was given to John Quincy Adams, the corrupt bargain. Uh, we have the presidential election trends. In 1824, 27% of adult white males voted. That was a corrupt bargain. Remember, it was stolen from Jackson, even though he got the popular vote. But in 1828, 58% of people um, to 1840, 80% of adult white males voted, which was a lot, lot higher. So more people are getting involved in politics. We have the um, publication of Democracy in America, which was a book written by Alexis de Tocqueville. He wrote a book arguing that America lacked the typical aristocracy hierarchy that Europe had, which allowed people to rise and fall on their own merit. So it wasn't so much based on who you were born, what were you born into, but what you could do with it. And this, uh, um, and this um, appealed to a lot of people in Europe because they're like, oh, in, in Europe, I'm stuck where I'm at based on where I'm born, but in America, I could be anything that I could be. The second party system, we have a loyalty to the party was more important than ideology. We see that today, for example, um, in Mitch McConnell, who is a Republican and doesn't always agree with um, Donald Trump, but he still stays loyal to the party because being a Republican is more important than actually supporting or not supporting the views of the leader of the Republican Party. We have the spoil system, which you know what it is, where you give patronage or rewards for supporting your job. Hey, you supported me in my election. Let me give you a job. Let me give your company a contract. Let me help you um, because you helped me in getting elected. In 1830, we have the two-party system at a national level. So now we start seeing the rise of two parties in this um, in this um, time frame. We have the Democrats um, led by Jackson and the Whigs led by Henry Clay. Remember that guy that didn't get to be, that did the corrupt bargain. We have the common man president. That's what Jackson was referred to because he allowed or was a president when more Americans were able to vote. He was the first president from the West from Tennessee. Um, he voted for equality for all white males. So that's why he's called the common man president. And he was against the wealthy. You remember, he was a humble Western president um, from the from Tennessee, and he did not did not like the bust, the Bank of the United States. There was a um, National Party Convention, which we still have today. This was the start of it, where they renominated Jackson in 1832. And they replaced the Congressional Caucus, where only let the legislator vote. Now it's more by the people and like uh, the Electoral College. So it gave, again, more power for the people. So we see a rise of mass politics, more people getting involved. Our federal union, John C. Calhoun, which was a VP, under John Quincy Adams and Jackson's first term, he wrote South Carolina Exposition in protest, which urged states to nullify the tariffs of abomination. Nullify means to get rid of. We no longer want it. Um, we have the right to veto it. And remember, John C. Calhoun is this guy right here at the bottom. We have the Kitchen Cabinet, which was a group of officials and unofficial advisors to Jackson. Think of it as the President's Cabinet, like people that support the President and give them advice um, when they need it. 
Webster and Hayes debate. Um, argue, again, there's always that argument between state and federal rights, and we're going to see that argument all the way to the Civil War. State rights, Hayne versus national power, which is Webster's. They were both great debaters, and Hayes advocated for nullification. Nullification, again, means to get rid of, uh, to get rid of or abolish. The second reply um, of Tuhane was Webster's advocated for national power, again, more centralized power. When you, when you compare this to other parts of history, Webster would be more like the Federalists that supported strong central powers. The nullification crisis, John C. Calhoun, the VP, resigned as VP and became the senator for South Carolina because they couldn't see eye to eye. So he resigned as VP for um, Jackson. The Supreme Court nullified, uh, nullified the, and it was all over the tariffs of 1828 to 1832, which brought us close to civil war. Why were the tariffs so important? Um, the tariffs were so important because um, the South disliked the, the tariffs. Remember, they did a lot of trading with Europe, and the tariffs made it more expensive for, um, for Americans to buy uh, uh, European goods, and that hurt the South because their biggest uh, b their biggest customers for cotton were the were Europeans, and if it was harder for them to purchase here in America, that hurt their business. So the South did not like the tariffs. The North did because they because it encouraged more people to buy American goods, but the South hated the tariffs, and it got so extreme that there was also that, that we came close to civil war, North and South, one of the first battles, nullification um, tariffs of 1828 and 1832. Then we have the great compromiser. We have Henry Clay coming in and saving the day one more time, thanks, just like he did with the Missouri Compromise. Um, he did another compromise called the Tariff of 1833. In the Tariff of 1833, he reduced the tariff rates by 10% per year for eight years. So this um, calmed down the South saying, hey, you are gonna we are going to reduce tariff by 10% for a period of eight years, so calm down. And it also allowed the North, including the president, uh, to use military force to collect taxes once those eight years were up. So it was compromise on both sides. Both of them agree, and yet again, we avoid a civil war. And we're going to go back to that man, man himself, um, Andrew Jackson, the removal of the Indians. Jackson advocated for the removal of, of natives west of the Mississippi River, beginning the idea of manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is the idea that God chose us, the American people, to expand from sea to shining sea. We have the right to expand our knowledge, expand our, our wisdom, expand our policy and our beliefs to the rest of the world. So it, we do have the right to expand to other parts of the territory. And unfortunately, that hurt natives. Native Americans. Andrew Jackson was not, not, not a supporter of Native Americans. Please, please, please know that. Um, and that has to do partly because he was from Tennessee and he had more interactions with Native Americans and obviously not nice ones since he was not a friend to them. The five civilized tribes uh, located in the South, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 aimed to move southern tribes to west of the Mississippi River. So remember, we're always moving them west where we don't want them. We don't want them in our territory, we don't want them in our land, and whenever we need the land, we're just going to keep on removing them. So the War said v. Georgia of 1832, remember that act was good for, um, for natives. It actually supported them in keeping their land um, in some way or another. The Supreme Court stated that, that Native Americans could not be forced to move. Remember, it was passed by the Supreme Court, but if the president, who is the executive um, branch, does not enforce it, it doesn't really have much teeth or much power. And that's exactly what happened. Jackson, Jackson ignored it, and ignored the decision, and still removed the Native Americans. Um, this was called um, and started the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears was in the winter of 1838, and it was the most brutal, horrible, um, treatment of Native Americans. Um, I would look deeper into this, um, look at outside sources to know more, to understand more. It forced the removal of a thousands, uh, thousands of Native Americans to the West. Um, and in this process, one eighth of the Native Americans died because of food shortage, the long voyage, the cold, the flu, and other factors. And when they finally arrived to the West, an, a quarter of their people were gone. Another problem that Jackson was not um, kin with was Jackson and the bank. 
Maysville Road veto. Jackson vetoed the bill that was part of the interstate commerce within a state trading uh, who would pay. There was always that battle between state and federal powers. Um, he was a strong supporter of, of state powers. Nicholas Biddle, he and Jackson were frenemies, or not even frenemies, but straight out enemies. He was the president of the bus, and he was considered the epitome or the image of wealthy and everything that was wrong with society, according to Jackson. He advocated for hard, um, he was, um, there, was on two, there was two arguments to the bus argument, hard money and soft money. Hard money advocates favored payments with gold and silver. This was favored by the wealthy who would who would who had gold and silver to pay with. Um, so this was favored by the wealthy. Soft money, on the other hand, was paper money, and this was favored by the poor because obviously they didn't um, have that much gold or silver, which they could pay off their debts a lot more. Um, but unfortunately, with that, that led to inflation. In 1832. There was a 1832 veto, which Jackson had the power to do. Jackson vetoed the recharter of the bus. Recharter means to like renew it, help it keep existing. So that means that if he, if he vetoed it, the bus would expire and it would no longer be allowed to exist in 1836. This was going to be a huge problem and it led to a recession. Um, on top of that, he removed the removal of the bank deposits. Because Jackson did not trust banks, he did not trust that banks and the federal government had the right to do that. Jackson removed all government deposits from the bus and placed them in state pet banks. So he removed it from the Federal National Bank of the United States and put it in small little state banks, in pet banks. Biddle, um, as kind of like a challenge to what Jackson was doing, called in all the loans. So all the money that the economy, that the federal government had borrowed from the bus um, to pay for wars, to pay for um, expansions, to pay for like different things that the, that the federal government asked for. He called in the loans and also for the money that regular people relied on. So when people that borrowed money from the bank, he was kind of like, hey, if you're gonna do all this stuff to the bank, I'm gonna recall all of my loans. So he called all the loans, which caused an economic crisis because people didn't have the money. People couldn't pay it right away, which caused an economic crisis um, in the making. Roger B. Taney appointed the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court after Marshall died in 1835. Remember, John Marshall was the one that stapled the Supreme Court as a powerful third branch of the government. We have the Charles River Bridge and Warren's Bridge of 1837, which basically meant that contracts could be breached if, the, if it benefited the community. This goes against, remember, the Dartmouth College versus Wordworth, which allowed um, private banks to kind of like have more president over state banks. This took away that power, this contracted it, the Charles River Bridge versus Warren Bridge, because now it allowed um, the government to take back, um, to do to do what they needed to do for the benefit of the community. Think of this as eminent domain. Eminent domain is when the government can go in and say, hey, I'm gonna get rid of all of these um, houses in this poor neighborhood and build uh, something that's gonna benefit the community. This, this is what happened when we built um, Dodger Stadium in the middle of LA. This is an example of the, gov the government coming in over the state's um, or city's powers. This guy is this guy is Nicholas Biddle, the one that Jackson hated, the frenemies. The changing phase of American politics, uh, we have new political systems coming around. We have the Whigs. Um, it was formed in response to King Arthur. We, we thought a lot of people called him King Arthur because he was um, meant to many considered a, a tyrant who was just putting his will of the Native Americans, of the bus, of his uh, common man policies in in government, so they refer to him as King Arthur, and they favored strong central government. They removed the industry and international um, improvement, especially in the West, and there was the anti, we also have the anti-Mason party. The first and the third party were the anti-secret society, um, which the Irish and the Germans, who the immigrants were during this time, tended to, to be democratic, so they were part of this um, group that favored the common man king. We have the specie circulation. Specie basically means money. All payments for land must be in gold or silver. So specie means money and it means um, 
All payments of land must be in gold and silver. Again, we're trying to destroy the Bank of the United States, which led to the Panic of 1837. It was cause for over-speculation. Um, remember, if ever in doubt, any recession or economic panic happens because of speculation. Speculation means you think something's going to do better than it actually does. Um, and crop failure um, panics led in Europe. So whenever we have a recession, it's because of speculation. The effects were that hundreds of banks failed, unemployment grew, and the prices of land grew.